So yes, my name's Glenn, and uh, I live in Eastbourne, and I go to All Souls Church there in Eastbourne, and uh, I'm very happy to come to Christ the King, Church of Christ the King. Uh, I'm actually an Anglican minister, right? So this church is incredibly gracious in allowing me in, but uh, every year there is a Sunday called Christ the King Sunday when we look at Matthew chapter 25, which is the Bible passage we're going to look at every year in Anglican churches around the world, they actually look at this parable, this parable of the sheep and the goats. And uh, I just want to pray for us now that we would really take these words to heart, that we would hear Jesus Christ, the judge of all the world, telling us about the future, and that he would speak into our presence, that he would shape us now and for eternity. That's a big prayer, isn't it? that Jesus would shape us now and into eternity. Um, But can we just do that now? Let Let me just pray for us, that we would hear from Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, we want to hear from you. You are the glorious Son of Man, the Son of God, the Judge and Savior of the world. So Lord Jesus, would you speak to us clearly, powerfully, personally, by your Spirit, that we might understand who you truly are and who we truly are. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, So you're in a series all about doubt at the moment. And uh, there are different things in the Christian faith that might make you doubt. Uh, You might not be a Christian, and therefore you have certain doubts about what Christians believe. But also you might be a Christian. And that doesn't stop you having doubts, does it? Um, Christians are still people with doubts, aren't they? I'm certainly someone who still has doubts. Um, I'm often saying to people who are investigating the Christian faith, look, you don't need to have every single doubt you would ever have about Christianity satisfied before you can become a Christian. That would be a really weird way to have a relationship with Jesus. You know, if, if you think that the way to have a relationship with Jesus is to have 17 questions, each more difficult than the last, and he has to satisfy all 17 questions before you become a Christian, it doesn't really work like that. I mean, no human relationships work like that, do they? I mean, if you're looking for a spouse, and the way you're looking for a spouse is with a clipboard and a pen and 17 questions, each more trickier than the last, you know, that's probably why you're single right now. Like, that... <laughs> That's, that's not how you meet someone, is it? How do you meet someone? You, you share their story, they share your story, you enter into their world, they enter into your world, and there's questions that happen and that sort of thing. But, you know, on the day you get married to someone, you don't have all the doubts assuaged, do you? you don't have, not every single question has been answered, but you know enough to trust this person. And then once you're inside the relationship, that's when all the questions begin, am I right? <laughs> All all the married people saying, yes, you know, (laughs) which is why the first year of marriage is so very, very interesting, you know, and you start to ask the big questions like, who are you? (laughs) Who raised you? What what is the deal with your family? And all these sorts of things. That all comes out on the far side of the relationship, but you know enough to trust the person, and therefore you can have doubts in other areas, and it's the same with Jesus. You know, I, I, I don't have every question sewn up in the Christian life. There's a great line in Mark chapter 9. There's a father who has a demon-possessed boy, and he brings him to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, if you can help my boy, please help him. And Jesus says, what? If you believe, everything's possible for him who believes. And the man says, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Which is just a fantastic verse about faith and doubt, isn't it? You ask any Christian, are you a believer? Yeah, I'm a believer. Do you have doubts? Yes, I have doubts. I believe. Help my unbelief. And today, we're thinking about the concept of judgment as something that might uh, might make you doubt. So maybe you're not a Christian, and perhaps the reality of judgment makes you doubt that there is a good God who can be trusted. Or maybe you are a believer, and maybe the reality of judgment makes you doubt yourself. And how am I going to go on that last day? So that this subject of, of judgment is something we really need to grapple with. But it's something that we in the West are not very good at thinking about. Um, I think largely because in the West, here in the UK, we live under the rule of law. There is a certain amount of justice that we expect in the world. And we live comfortable lives by and large. 
such that if you asked other people around the world or down through history to have a look at our lives, they would think we'd already arrived in heaven. They, they, would, they would see incredible levels of justice that we already have in the West, incredible levels of comfort that we have in the West. And so here in the West, we don't tend to long for the judge to show up in ways that other people around the world and down through history have. There are many people right now who are not living under the rule of law, who are living below the poverty line, and they cannot wait for the judge of the world to show up and set things right. And actually, that's a much more biblical way of thinking. In the Bible, people call on Jesus to come. It's one of the great calls of the New Testament, Maranatha. It's this Aramaic word that just says, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus. The Old Testament is just full of people talking about, hallelujah, the Lord will come and judge the world. You could read a psalm in the Old Testament book of songs, the, the, the book of Psalms, Psalm 96 or Psalm 100, talks about, you know, shout for joy all the earth for the judge of the world comes. It's a wonderful thing in the Bible's thinking for the judge of all the world to come and set things straight. It's the heart's cry of so many people around the world, and yet in our own hearts, we get a little bit antsy about this idea. I was at Kingston University a couple of years ago. I was talking to a, an English student um, about Jesus, and, and I, I gave her a John's Gospel, one of these four biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and John begins by saying, Jesus is the Word of God, which means he's the expression of God. He's everything that God wants to say to you, wrapped up in a person. And I was saying to her, wouldn't it be amazing if God showed up and if he was exactly like Jesus? Wouldn't that be amazing if God showed up and he was the kind of God who stoops and serves and suffers and bleeds and dies like Jesus does? Wouldn't that be amazing if God showed up? And she said, no. I said, why not? She said, that would be really inconvenient. I said, what do you mean inconvenient? She said, well, I, I just like to live my life the way I live my life. It would be really inconvenient if God showed up. And actually, she's just speaking for how many of us think, especially in the comfortable, affluent West, especially in a place where we live under a rule of law, we don't want God to show up because we're comfortable, because we think we've got it made. And Jesus showing up and being a judge is this massive reality check for us, a reality check that we're not too sure we want. Well, let's listen to Jesus' words and let's hear him speak to us about judgment. And I want to show you from this parable from Matthew chapter 25 that there is a reality to judgment, that there is a comfort to judgment, and there is a transforming power to judgment. I want to actually convert you to thinking that Jesus the judge is good news. Okay, that's a tall order perhaps, but let's see how we go. Matthew chapter 25 from verse 31. Jesus is speaking. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will say to them, saying, Truly, I say to you, 
As you did not do it to one of, these least, one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Heavy words, right? Heavy words coming from the most loving man who ever lived. I hope you kind of have that view of Jesus, whether you're a Christian or not. But actually Jesus is, he's just love covered over in flesh. Here is this one with his arms outstretched to the world. This is, this is Jesus and yet he has these words about this day. And he wants to convince us of the reality of judgment. And I wonder how it makes you feel. Verse 31 talks of one day when the Son of Man will come in his glory. Just think about that. It says that he will come and all the angels with him will come. Just think about that. He will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. Think about that. All the nations will be gathered before King Jesus. Think about that. And our lives will be laid bare before Christ. Everything we do now is taken into account then. How do you feel about that? We don't usually spend a lot of time thinking about this, do we? Um, the Bible does. On average, every 13 verses in the New Testament speak of the return of Jesus Christ. So in these verses, we're going to face the reality of judgment. We're going to see the comfort of judgment and the transforming power of judgment. Those three things, the reality, the comfort, and the transforming power of judgment. Um, but perhaps those first two points surprise you. Reality of judgment and comfort of judgment? Surely not. Surely if we want comfort, we need to dismiss the reality of judgment. And if we think of the reality of judgment, surely there's no comfort there, is there? That's what John Lennon thought. 1971, he sings, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. John Lennon saying, let's have a dream, let's have comfort, and let's deny the reality of heaven and hell and judgment and all of that. But he thinks it's either or. Jesus Christ thinks it's both ends. John Lennon wants to say, no heaven, no hell, we live for now. Jesus Christ says, yes, heaven, yes, hell, and what we do now echoes in eternity. Who do we prefer? Do we prefer John Lennon or Jesus Christ? There are times when we want to cling on to John Lennon and maybe silence the words of Jesus Christ. But I want to say to you that if you deny the reality of judgment, you will also deny much comfort, much comfort. Because actually everyone believes in a judge. Everyone believes in judgment. Whether you're religious, secular, whether you're of some faith or of no faiths at all, everyone believes in judgment. So if you're Hindu or Buddhist, uh, you believe in karma. Karma is your judge. What you do comes back around to you and your eternity will be shaped, your afterlife will be shaped by your actions, your deeds. There is a judge there. Uh, in Islam, Allah is the judge. And if you have submitted to Allah sufficiently, then perhaps you will earn paradise. But Allah is the judge. But if you don't believe in Jesus or in Buddha or in Muhammad, Perhaps you're a very secular person and, and you just say, well, when I die, I rot, and that's it. Well, then death is the judge. And let me say to you that death is the most brutal, merciless judge ever imagined by man. Death cares nothing for your life. Death snatches away the murderer and the murder victim. Death judges the sex trafficker, and the campaigner against sex trafficking, and judges them exactly the same. Death judges the abuser and the victim exactly the same. Death is the most unjust, merciless, 
and brutal judge that there's ever been. Some think that if you get, a, if you get rid of Jesus, then you're getting rid of a fairy tale in your life. But I want to challenge you, if, if you think that way, I want to challenge you that actually if you, get, if you get rid of Jesus the judge, then you're going to have to face death as the judge, and then you're going to have to come up with a whole bunch of other fairy tales that will tell you why you should live a kind, righteous, upstanding, self-giving life. Because I, t- I take it that everyone here kind of wants to live the kind of self-giving life that Jesus speaks of here. We all want to act like the sheep that Jesus speaks of in this parable. We all want to clothe the poor and feed the hungry. We, we want not to be so selfish and curved in on ourselves. We want to be the generous people that Jesus speaks of here. But if death is the judge, why? Why? Because none of that counts in eternity. I'll put it this way. If you're on the Titanic and you're going down... Are you going to spend the last two hours of your life hugging people or mugging people? Um, ultimately, if death is the end, who cares? Really, who cares? In the, in the cosmic sands of time, those two hours that you're going to spend either hugging or mugging make absolutely no difference whatsoever. You see, if death is the judge, we have the most unjust judge imaginable. And then we have to start inventing reasons why we should live good, upright lives, the kind of lives that we know are good lives. And yet those lives don't really make sense if death is simply the judge. In the face of judgment, some want to doubt God, to doubt his goodness. But actually, if you get rid of God, you don't get rid of judgment. All you do is abandon judgment to that tyrannical, brutal overlord called death. Thank God that death is not our ultimate judge. Thank God that a gigantic mass grave is not our final destination. Such a gospel does not only make the future bleak, it makes life now bleak. There is good news here, though. Jesus is the judge. Verse 31, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. He is the judge. And if you wanted to look up what the Son of Man means, you could maybe go to Daniel chapter 7 in the Old Testament and see all the richness of that title. But really what the Son of Man means is he's the essence of man. He's the essence of humanity. He is the human one, the humane one. And Jesus says he is the judge. The very essence of of humanity and humaneness. He is the judge. And let's just think about what a difference that makes. Because you will not find another judge like Jesus. If you go to Buddhism, Hinduism, karma is your your judge. What you do rebounds back to you. You are judged by your works. There's no grace or mercy there. Judgment is not according to grace or mercy. It's according to your performance. With Allah, it's the same. It's down to your performance. With death, I guess, I guess it's sort of universal suffrage with death. Everyone gets death, <laughs> however you've performed. But it's coming your way. But there is this brutality to death. There is no clemency with that judge. There is only one judge that is on offer. Only one judge that is actually a merciful judge. That's actually a compassionate, loving judge. There is this son of man. How wonderful to know that he is the judge. You know, if you could elect a judge, you can't, by the way. It's not not down to you. It's not down to me. You can't pick one. But if you could pick one, wouldn't you pick Jesus? Here is this one, this son of man who climbs down from the judgment seat, puts himself into the dock and takes the harshest judgment there's ever been so that no one need ever face his judgment ever. That's a judge that you'd want to face, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you? Isn't that the judge that you can trust? Here in Matthew 25, Jesus is on his way to the cross. In the very next chapter, Jesus is about to go into a garden called the Garden of Gethsemane. It's Thursday night, the night before he dies. He is sweating blood. He's overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death because he's about to face the suffering of judgment on the cross. He speaks about it like a cup. 
It's a big image in the Bible. All the way through the Bible, it talks about the cup of judgment that all the nations must drink down because of their murderousness, because of their injustice. It's almost like the, the whole world is queuing up for this cup and all hell is distilled into the goblet. It's this judgment that all of us must face. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew chapter 26, Jesus goes into this garden and he prays, Father, take this cup away from me, yet not my will but yours be done. And you start to think, what, Jesus, are you, are you going to drink the cup? Why should you drink the cup? You are the perfect, pure son of God. You are the son of man. You are the essence of all that is humane and good and right and up, upright. Are you really going to drink this cup? And he prays three times, Father, if, if it is your will, I will drink it, but I don't want to drink it. And he, and he wrestles in prayer. And essentially in those prayers, he's basically saying, look, Lord, I, either I drink the cup or the people do. Either I go into this furnace of judgment or the world does. Either I go to the cross or the world does. Either I go to hell or the world does. And after wrestling in prayer, he rises and he essentially says, Father, let it be me. And he volunteers for the judgment of the world. In Matthew 27, he literally takes the judgment of the world. It's focused down on him on that cross. On Matthew 28, he rises again from death, punches a hole through death and out the other side so that death is not the end. Yes, you and I will all go into the grave. We will all meet with the grave. But because Jesus is greater than the grave, he will raise us up. We will meet Jesus. He is the judge at the end of all things. But he is the one judge who is merciful. He is the one judge who doesn't just give you what you deserve. He's the one judge who has taken the judgment so that you never need take it. There's a great... Um, parable written about this. Um, it's called The Long Silence. And it speaks about Judgment Day and how wonderful it is that Jesus is the judge. Imagine this. At the end of time, billions of people were scattered on a great plain before God's throne. Most shrank back from the brilliant light before them, but some groups near the front talked heatedly. Can God judge us? How can he know about suffering? snapped a young Albanian. He removes his shirt to reveal a bullet-scarred back. In Kosovo, we endured terror, shootings, torture. In another group, an aged Aboriginal woman pulls a crumpled photograph from her pocket. What about this? she demanded. This is my precious child. I've not seen her since the day she was stolen away for no crime but being black. In another crowd, a pregnant schoolgirl with sullen eyes said, why should I suffer? It wasn't my fault. Far out across the plain, there were hundreds of such groups. Each had a complaint against God for the evil and suffering he permitted in his, in his world. How lucky God was to live in heaven where there was no weeping or fear or hunger or hatred. What did God know of all that people had been forced to endure in this world? For God leads a pretty sheltered life, they said. So each of these groups sent forth their leader, chosen because he had suffered the most. A Jew, a victim of Hiroshima, a horribly deformed arthritic, a thalidomide child. In the center of the plain, they consulted with each other. At last, they were ready to present their case. It was rather clever. Before God could be qualified to be their judge, he must endure what they had endured. Their decision was that God should be sentenced to live on earth as a man. Let him be born into a hated race, they said. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted. Give him a work so difficult that even his family will think him out of his mind when he tries to do it. Let him be betrayed by his closest friends. Let him face false charges, be tried by a prejudiced jury and convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him be tortured. At the last, let him see what it means to be terribly alone. Then let him die. Let him die so that there can be no doubt that he died. Let there be a great host of witnesses to verify it. As each leader announced his portion of the sentence, loud murmurs of approval went up from the throng. And when the last had finished pronouncing sentence, there was a long silence. No one uttered another word. No one moved. 
for suddenly all knew that God had already served his sentence. That's the difference that it makes for Jesus to be the judge. And here is good news. The judge of man is the son of man, the one who became man. In fact, the one who became judged in our place. We believe in this judge who climbed down from the judgment seat, put himself in the dock and took the harshest judgment so that no one need ever have to do the same. This is the judge that we love. And it's a great comfort to us because what it means is that his kind of life has been vindicated. If death is the end, then I guess what kind of life is vindicated if death is really the judge of all things? I guess just trying to survive. It's a dog-eat-dog world out there, and if you can climb on top of the next guy, I guess good for you. That kind of life is vindicated if death is the judge. If Jesus is the judge, what kind of life is vindicated? It's the life of self-giving love, right? It's the life of sacrifice. It's the life of the arms wide open to the world. Jesus being the judge is good news. It means that everything, your, your deepest intuitions about what the good life is are right. The life of the sheep, that life of, of feeding the hungry and healing the sick and clothing the naked, that life is the good life. It's the life of all eternity. And therefore, you can start living it now with Jesus. There is great comfort in knowing that Jesus is the judge. But it is a stark reality. A very stark reality. In verse 32, Jesus says, All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Verse 34, To those on his right he says, Come you who are blessed. Verse 41, to those on his left, he says, depart you who are cursed. Therefore, verse 46, there are those who go away to eternal punishment, and there are those who come and inherit eternal life. That is quite a separation, don't you think? It's either right or left, sheep or goats, blessed or cursed, come or depart, eternal life or eternal punishment. There are only two camps in the end. It's, it's not the right or the left or those in the middle. It's not come or depart or just hang around where you are. It's not the sheep or the goats or the cattle or the pigs or the hens or just two camps. Just two camps. And when you realize that, it is so natural then to start to doubt, Right? It is so natural then to start to think, gosh, am I on the right side? Will I be on the right side on that day? Let me ask you. Don't say it out loud, but, but do answer in your heart. Do you think on the last day you will end up on the right side of things? What do you think? Here's what many people say. What many people say is, I hope so. I, I hope I've done enough. I hope God has forgiven that thing that I've done, or, or maybe he's just forgotten. I hope he's forgotten that thing that I've done. Or maybe you're thinking, I, I don't hope that I'll be on the right side. I, 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 think, I think I'm probably on the left. I think I'm probably a goat. And I don't know what kind of doubts you have about this last day. But so often, if you're looking within yourself in order to answer this question, if you're looking to your own performance to answer this question, where will I be on the last day? If you're looking to yourself to answer the question, you are thinking like a goat. It's the way goats think. If you think that you can do things in order to become a sheep, or that because you've done such bad things, you must forever remain a goat. If you're thinking in those terms, you're thinking like a goat. Did you notice about the goats in, in, in here? They think so differently from the sheep. The sheep, when Jesus brings up all the great stuff that they did, they're completely blissfully unaware of what they've done. 
So verse 38, they say to Jesus, when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? They were doing all these things, but they weren't taking note of them. They weren't standing on them as though that's their spiritual CV that they're trying to build. Jesus talks about, you know, let your giving be so that your, your left hand doesn't even know what your right hand is doing. It's that kind of thing. It just bubbles out of them. This Christ-likeness bubbles out of the sheep. And they're not trying to climb the ladder towards heaven. They're not trying to earn anything. They just know the good shepherds. And because they know the good shepherd, they act like sheep. They just do. Not so with the goats. It's fascinating, isn't it? When, the, when Jesus brings up with the goats that they haven't been behaving in these Christ-like ways, what do they say? Verse 44 Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? It's interesting, isn't it? The the sheep can't ever think of a time when they've done good stuff. And the goats can't think of a time when they didn't do good stuff. It's interesting, isn't it? The way the goats are thinking. Sheep know that you you cannot earn eternal life. Sheep know that good deeds do not get you in. Goats think you can earn eternal life. They think that maybe they have done enough. But that's goat thinking. So what about you? Where will you be when the Son of Man comes in his glory? You can understand how well you understand the Christian gospel by asking yourself, how do I feel about the return of Christ? How do I feel if I knew that Jesus is returning tomorrow? How would I feel about that? Actually, in the Bible, people long for that. Like I say, whole psalms are written saying that, you know, let the nations be glad, let all the peoples rejoice, let the trees clap their hands, for the Lord comes to judge the world. Hallelujah. Because if you know the good shepherds, then you know yourself to be his sheep. That's the way it works. John chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. They hear my voice. And maybe through coming to CCK or coming to Alpha or reading the scriptures yourselves or in conversation with a Christian friend, if if you're not sure whether you're a sheep or not, listen to the voice of the good shepherd. Keep listening to Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus. Keep seeing this gracious judge who went to the cross even for you. Keep looking to him and you'll find yourself recognizing his voice. You'll you'll find yourself knowing him and knowing that he knows you. And all of a sudden you find, ah, I'm a sheep. I'm a sheep. And it's by faith. Simply by faith. And when you know the good shepherds, Judgment Day is no longer doomsday for you. When you know the Good Shepherd, Judgment Day is the happy last day. That's how, Jesus, that's how Martin Luther described Judgment Day. He said one of the massive shifts between the medieval understanding of judgment and this reformation that Martin Luther was bringing about in the 16th century, basically protesting against All the goat-like thinking of the medieval church when people are trying to do, 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 climb, 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 and they never know whether they've done enough. And Martin Luther said, everyone in the medieval understanding thought of Judgment Day as doomsday. When you understand that simply trusting in Jesus, you become a sheep, then it becomes the happy last day. It's a comfort. It's a tremendous comfort to know Jesus. Do you know the good shepherd. Do you hear his voice? Is he calling to you? You see, maybe, maybe you think, oh, I'm a goat. I'm, I'm stuffed on judgment day. <laughs> There's no hope for me. This is why Jesus died. No one can earn their way in. But Jesus took the judgment, rose up again to offer you his eternal life. And you can say, Jesus, I want to be yours. You can know the good shepherd. He can know you. You can become that sheep. And then there's a transforming power. And that's the final point. There's a transforming power to judgment. That actually, 
Once we understand who Jesus is, it changes us into Christ-like people. You'll have noticed that the the sheep act in incredibly Christ-like ways in this parable. The sheep are feeding the hungry, giving water to the thirsty. They are inviting strangers in. They are clothing the naked. They are looking after the sick. They are visiting those in prison. And Jesus says, as you start to do that, you're not just copying me. It's not just like we're being Christ-like as we act like sheep. He says, actually, you're serving me because Jesus says, I am in those weak, those poor, those defenseless. I am in the vulnerable. I put myself into the least and the last and the lost. Jesus is like the, the, the ultimate undercover boss. Do you ever see those programs? Undercover boss where you know, the big CEO decides to come down and like, work in McDonald's and, and, and starts being ordered around by these spotty 17-year-olds. And, you know, and little does the spotty 17-year-old know that they're actually dealing with the boss. Okay? Jesus loves to do that. Jesus puts himself into the poor. And he says, I know how you treat me by how you treat the poor. And here is an opportunity to love Jesus by loving the poor. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Jesus is like the secret millionaire coming down. And what does he look like? He looks like the beggar, doesn't he? He looks like the guy in prison, doesn't he? He looks like the single mum needing help. He, he looks like the least, the last, the lost, those who are really in need of our help. Do you want to serve Jesus? Serve the poor around you. There is a transforming power to knowing Jesus the judge, and it changes us into Christ-like kind of people. So this is Jesus' parable about judgment. He speaks of the reality of judgment, the comfort of judgment, and the transforming power of judgment. And I've just got to ask you, do you know this judge? And do you know him as your savior? Because this is why he came. Jesus says when he comes into the world, he has not come into the world to judge the world, but to save the world. That actually the whole point of his coming to planet Earth is to actually take that judgment on himself so that you get the eternal life. Is this something you want for yourself? It's more important than anything else, isn't it? We split the world into such ridiculous little things, you know. Are you an iPhone person or an Android person? You know, I, I think that's an ephemeral issue compared to are you a sheep or a goat, right? This, this is the big issue. And you can sort out Judgment Day today. You can call on the Lord Jesus and you can know him as your good shepherd, leading you on as a sheep.